Hello. We're going to be continuing our study in Acts. We're going to have an example of Paul preaching to believers. This is the only example we have of that. It is interesting to note that he seems, seems to be defending himself against these charges that are apparently recurrent about his person and motives. And so it's a little defensive through here. He's saying, you know how I live with you. You know how I acted. And, and so we have some of that, uh, uh, what should I say, a reaction to his critics, either the Judaizers or Gnostics, we're not sure. We have examples of Paul preaching to uh, the Jews in the synagogue in Acts 13, 60 and following. We've seen examples of Paul preaching to the Greeks in 14, 15 and following and 17, 22 and following. And here he's going to speak to believers. There are many parallels between Paul's letters and this message. And that's as it should be. So let's look at the text if we could. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. Now, Miletus is about 30 miles south of Ephesus seaport, and so it took them about a day's travel, a stay to day, and a day back. So they're gone three days from their work. That shows that these leaders had some kind of freedom uh, from getting away from their daily work, or maybe they, the church had started to pay them some, has had to get away, we're just not sure. Notice where it says, um, the elders. Now, this is the word presbyteroi. Notice it's plural. I believe the early church had multiple pastors. Um, and I, I think that's important. We see that. Different leaders with different gifts. Now, the word presbyteroi, there's been a lot of question about how is it related to the term episkopoi that's found down in verse 28. It's often translated overseers or bishops. Because of this chapter here, when comparing verse 17 with verse 28, and because of Titus chapter 1, verses 5 and 7, in my uh, exegetical opinion, the terms elder, bishop, and pastor are synonymous for one office in the church. There seems to be two offices, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, pastors and deacons. Now, it seems that elders has a more Jewish background and bishops has a more Greek background and maybe that's why the two terms are used, one uh, from a, that Jewish perspective, one from a Greek perspective, but here it seems to be they are synonymous. Now the term church, ekklesia, ek out of, kaleo, to call, the called out ones. We learned back from earlier in chapter 19, verse uh, 39, that this is the common term for a Greek town assembly or, or a meeting of people. Now, the reason that the early church took this title for itself was that in the Septuagint, the little Hebrew phrase, the congregation of Israel, the word congregation was translated by its kahal in Hebrew, was translated by the Greek phrase ekklesia. So I think the early church picked this to say we are the people of God just like the Old Testament. It also picked it, I think, because by being called out, the inference is God's initiating, electing covenant love. And so they were called into being by God. They are the same kind of family of God as the Old Testament. When they arrived, he said to them, now here's the sermon. You know how I lived among you. Paul is saying, you knew from the very first day I got there how I lived, what my attitude was, how I served you and ministered you and did not take advantage of you. Now here's right off the bat, he seemed to be giving a a defensive stance. What he's saying is my walk and my talk coincided. Now, friends, I want to tell you that's real important in a way to judge leadership. Do what, what they preach and what they live balance. Uh, from all the time from the day I first set foot in the province of Asia, Roman province of Asia, western Turkey, and how I continued to serve the Lord with all humility and tears. Now, the word humility is a uniquely Christian, Christian virtue. The Greeks thought it was a lowly kind of uh, uh, un, um, what should I say, unmanly kind of uh, virtue. But for Christianity, it's very important. The two people in the Bible who are called humble are Moses and Jesus. It is a, an attribute of the Lord for us to emulate, and it means a lowliness of mind and spirit. Now, the word tears is used down in verse 31. I think it refers to the fact that he really had a burden for these people both the lost people of the city and for the new believers. Paul cared about them, prayed about them, agonized over them, seems to be the, the meaning here. Uh, Through the trials that befell me because of the plots of the Jews. 
Now, we're not sure exactly what Paul's referring to, but in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, he talks about some of the trials at Ephesus. Here, the specific mention of the Jews. We know that there's a problem with uh, Demetrius and, and the Greek silversmiths and on and on. There, Paul had real problems. Needless to say, this great opportunity at Ephesus was matched by great adversity. And I, I have found that's always true of the Lord's work. Now, notice where it says in verse 20, I never shrank from telling you anything that was good. Now, the word shrank here is used again down in verse um, 27. It's a nautical term for a ship dropping its sails or, or, or slacking its uh, sails to either in a windstorm or to come to port. Paul's saying, I did not stop my enthusiasm, my proclamation of the good news because of the problems nor from telling you in public and in private. Paul had public meetings, uh, I guess the primary focus being the lecture hall of Tyrannus from 11 to 1, and then he had private meetings in the homes. He taught publicly and privately. It also shows he was interested in corporate worship and private instruction. Notice it says, but constantly and earnestly uh, I urge Greeks as well as Jews. And that tells me this, there's one message for both. There's not a message for Jews and a message for Greeks. There's one gospel. And I really think there's one message, Old Testament and New. And biblical faith is a repentance and faith toward God through his revealed will. To turn with repentance to God and to have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now these seem to be the two prerequisites for salvation. These very same two, repentance and faith, is seen in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. In my opinion, faith is the positive uh, aspect and repentance is the negative. We turn from self and to God in Christ. Now, repentance, in Hebrew, it speaks of a change of action. In Greek, it speaks of a change of mind. Both show that we've turned from self to God. It's not a sinlessness, but it is an attitude, an attitude of life that issues in the, a lifestyle, the way we live. Uh, repentance, you know, the early heretics used to say, y'all say only believe, only believe. But only believe has never been the New Testament message. It's been repent and believe, turn from, turn to. Now, the word faith is very interesting. It's the word pistis, or pistuo is the verb. It means to, to volitionally commit yourself to someone. There is a cognitive element. There is an emotional element. But the primary focus is that our whole person trusts or commits ourselves to the trustworthiness of God's promises in the life, ministry, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. Now, it says Lord Jesus. Lord Curios is used by New Testament authors to emphasize the deity of Jesus of Nazareth, while Jesus, which means Yahweh saves, Matthew 1, 21, is used more in the sense of his humanity. Okay? Now, notice where it mentions here, verse 22, and I am here now on my way to Jerusalem because I am impaled by the Spirit. Now, this impaled by the Spirit has the same ambiguity of chapter 9, 21. Should it be a little s or a big s? If it's a little s, it's Paul's self-determination. If it's a big s, it's the definite leadership of the Holy Spirit. From the context, it seems that a capital S seems to be, to me at least, uh, more appropriate. Um, though I am not aware uh, that I will, what will befall me there. Now, Paul admits that he's ready to go to Jerusalem because he felt like it's God's will, though he's not sure what's going to befall him. But very soon in this chapter, prophets, one after another in different places, are going to appear and tell Paul what's going to happen. It's going to be imprisonment and suffering. But Paul feels led by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem as Jesus felt led by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem, even knowing that suffering and persecution and death awaits him. Friends, sometimes God lets us know there are problems ahead, but that doesn't mean it's still not God's will for us to go through those problems, and that's exactly what we have here. Now, notice in verse 25, oh, excuse me, uh, back up in verse 24. But now I count as nothing the sacrifice of my life. Wow, wow. Look at this, verse 23. Except that in town after town, the Holy Spirit emphatically assures me that imprisonment and suffering await me. Now, this suffering was told by Paul back at his conversion, Acts 9, 16. God told Ananias that Paul would suffer many things and speak to heathen kings. And it seems in Acts 21, 4 and Acts 21, 10 through 12 is where these prophets start telling him that also. Verse 24, now I count as nothing the sacrifice of my life if only I can finish my race. 
Now, Paul is very fond of these athletic metaphors to describe the Christian life. I have a sermon on uh, Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 that I call the Christian athlete, which I think uses those same athletic metaphors. Here, let me give you a few references of where the idea of race or boxing or, or I run is used. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, Galatians 2, 2, Philippians 2, 16, 2 Timothy 4, 7 are some of the examples of Paul's athletic metaphors. And render the service entrusted to me by the Lord Jesus. Paul saw himself as a steward of the gospel message and as a steward of his particular ministry to the Gentile churches. Friends, I want you to know that your life in its totality, your resources, your spiritual gift, the place God's put you, your personality, all of that, you are a steward unto God and will give uh, an account. Now, when it mentions here, uh, verse 25, For now I know that none of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will ever see my face again. Now, that's sad. Paul, apparently, that's related to either Paul wanting to go to Spain and saying, I'm not going to work in this field anymore for a while, or the ideal of imprisonment and suffering with possibility of death would keep him from coming back. One of those two is assured. The idea of you, the kingdom, the kingdom of God is the central message of Jesus' sermons. It's all of his parables start out, the kingdom of God is likened to. His first sermon relates to the kingdom of God. His last sermon relates to the kingdom of God. It's the central idea of the Gospels. I think it's the reign of God in men's hearts now that will be one day consummated over all the earth. It's the whosoever will in time of the eternal reign of God. When Jesus prays in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, he's praying for the kingdom of God to come in fullness and reality on earth. Now, notice where it says, verse 26. And by the way, that reference to Spain is, is Romans 15, 23 and following. I therefore protest to you today that I am not responsible for the blood of any of you. Now, why would he say that? Well, Paul's getting a little sensitive, I think, about the criticism he's receiving. And, and God knows he had a right to because they really picked on him in some very inappropriate areas, especially at Corinth. But apparently there was some problem in, the, uh, in Asia as well. Now, when he says here, uh, this blood, it's the same kind of Jewish metaphor that's mentioned in Acts 18.6 about uh, shaking the dust off his clothes. It's the idea that I told you the truth and you rejected it. Now you are responsible. I think it goes back to an Old Testament prophetic allusion found in uh, Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 16 and following, and Ezekiel 33, verses 1 through 6, that he was a watchman, that he was responsible until he told them the truth. And when he told them the truth, then they're responsible to respond or not respond to it. Verse 27. Uh, For I never shrank from telling you God's whole plan. Now, some think here, this is on God's whole plan, that the Judaizers had been saying, Paul, you're not preaching God's whole plan. You're not ta talking about circumcision and the food laws of the Old Testament. But what Paul would say is, I am preaching the whole gospel. And the gospel does not always include the ritualistic ceremonialism of Old Testament Judaism. And so he's saying, I preach the whole plan of God. And that'll be the will of every preacher to preach the whole counsel of God and not just the themes that he's comfortable with or the themes that he's experienced or the themes that his denomination approves. We ought to preach all the Bible because all the Bible is the word of God. But there are some priorities and the gospel message is focused into the fulfillment to the, uh, the climax found in the New Testament. Take care of yourselves and of the whole flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers so as to continue, continue to be shepherds of the church of God. Now here is the Old Testament metaphor of the people of God as a flock. Now that may come from the fact that the, the leaders are called shepherds in the Old Testament. I think Ezekiel 36 is a good example. Uh, God as shepherd of his people in Psalms 23. So here the leaders of the church are called elders, bishops, or pastors, which is a, the root of pastor is from the idea of the shepherd or the feed. Now, when it mentions here, notice that, that, that the uh, whole flock, I think that's talking about Jews and Gentiles. There's only one people of God now called the church. The Holy Spirit has made you. There's the idea of the large leadership in pastoral leaders as you continue to be shepherds of the church of God. That's very interesting. Some manuscripts have the church of the Lord. Now, the church of God is found uh, in A, C, D, and in the papyri, P74. Uh, so it's very good manuscript attestation. But the word Lord is found in Aleph and B, which would be Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. 
And so the manuscripts are real split, and I'm not real sure which one I think is best. So I don't think it's really important here. It's in the church of God or the church of the Lord, which he bought with his own blood. Now, that is important. But this little phrase seems to imply that the church of God, which he bought with his own blood, implies the church of God is Jesus' church. Now, by that, I think it's an ambiguous way of asserting the full deity of Jesus. Paul does this in several ambiguous ways, but strong enough for us as commentators to make an affirmation that he is asserting the full deity of Jesus. You might want to see these references. Uh, Romans 9, 5, Colossians 2, 9, and Titus 2, 13 for some other possible ambiguous references to Jesus as full God. Now, verse 29, because I know that I have, have done, because I know that after I have gone, violent wolves will break in among you and they will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will appear who will try to, uh, by speaking perverse truth, to draw away disciples after them. Several important things here. This idea of violent wolves is a metaphor that Jesus used about false teachers. We see it in Matthew 7, 15. We see it in Luke 10, 3. We see it in John 10, 12. Now notice the next two verses. Uh, verse 29, they're going to come from outside. Verse 30, they're going to come from within the church. So there's going to be people who look like believers, act like uh, uh, reverers of God and his, and his truth, but they really are not going to be. They're going to speak perverse things. This is a perfect passive verbal form, twisted things, the idea of taking the truth and twisting it. And they're going to draw away. The word here is to draw a sword as to cut something in half. They're going to separate the fellowship and draw some weak believers after them. Now, for that use of drawing the sword, for this phrase, you might want to see Matthew 26, 51. So ever be on guard. This is a present imperative continually watch and the idea here is watch y'all watch you may go back to ezekiel 3 and 33 again you're a watchman you're responsible he's speaking to church leaders here be on guard for these false teachers now to me false teachers only come in the area of the person and work of christ there are some irreducible minimums most of them are late to who god is who christ is and how salvation comes there are many peripheral things we should not, we should not uh, destroy the fellowship over peripheral issues. We ought to talk about them in love. But for those irreducible ones, we lay down our lives and we, we, we withstand false teaching in those crucial areas to the death. Now, notice where it mentions here. Let's see. Ever be on guard and always remember that for three years, Paul stayed longer in Ephesus than any other city. Now, he stayed in Corinth about a year and a half, but Ephesus three years because of the revival as well as the problems there, I think. Stayed three years. Uh, night and day, I never cease warning you, one by one, and with tears. Oh, you catch this personal element that he poured his life into these men and then this church? Now, verse 32. And now I commit you to the Lord. This means to entrust someone to. You might want well to see 1 Timothy 1, 18, 2 Timothy 2, 2. He is entrusting to God. Now, because of the next few references, few verses about how he uh, knelt in prayer at the ship and pray for these elders. I think this is something like the ordination service of Paul and Barnabas going on a mission trip from the church at Antioch. He's going to commit them to the Lord. He's going to have a special prayer service where he lays hands on them and commits them to God's trust and care as he leaves them. I think that's what it's talking about. And we can see that in verse 36 and then chapter 21, uh, verse 5. You might want to look at that. Okay. Notice it commits to, to the Lord and to the message of his grace, favor, the undeserved, unmerited grace of God, oh man, which is able to build you up and to give you and your proper possession. This word possession is the word inheritance. That's an Old Testament idiom again, that God gave him the promised land, but more than that, God gave him himself, that God is their inheritance. You might want to see Romans 8, 15 through 17 and Galatians 4, 1 through 7 for parallel references about the inheritance. Now, among all God's consecrated people, there's the ideal of the root for saint or consecrated or holy. We're not holy because we necessarily don't live above sin. We're holy because of our connection with, in Christ. But because we know Christ, our lives are going to be more holy in the way we are. Not sinless, I don't think, but certainly sinning less. Now, I have never coveted any man, silver, gold, or clothes. This is the three areas of wealth in the ancient world, silver, gold, and raiment. 
you know yourselves that the uh, my hands of mine provided my own needs for my own companions now we know that philippi helped him a couple of times we think that thessalonica possibly helped him but no other church would paul let him help for this reason he got so much criticism about his motives that he wanted to preach free so no one could ca- charge him of preaching for money or sponging off the churches. Let me give you a few references where the idea of, of uh, Jews having a vocation and working with their hands and not being paid for their teachings. Now we'll see 1 Corinthians 4.12, 1 Corinthians 9, 3 and following, 2 Corinthians 11, 7 and following, 2 Corinthians 12.13, 1 Thessalonians 2, 3 and following, and 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 and following. All right? Now, verse uh, 35, And everything I showed you that by working hard like this, we will will help those who are weak. Now, I want to tell you something, friends. This is not the Protestant work ethic. This is saying that we really labor hard as believers, doing a quality job in Jesus' name. And the funds we get, we don't work hard just so we can have more and more. We don't work hard so we can have a bigger car and a bigger house and more things. We work hard as believers so we may help others in Jesus' name. Boy, we've missed that in America. We say, boy, I've worked for it. It's mine. I'm going to work harder and get more. Prosperity and materialism has so blinded the modern church that we think that our egotistical, self-centered, luxury lifestyle is the will of God, and we try to rationalize scriptures to back up our extravagant, comfort-bound laziness. Friends, we work hard and quality as believers so that we might give more to the cause and work of Jesus Christ. We live below our means for the gospel's sake. We need to hear that in a credit-bound, materialistic society. Now, it continues. Uh, He quotes Jesus. It makes one happier to give than to get. But did you know this quote is never in any of the four gospels? Now, we call this in theology one of the sayings of Jesus. And many of us believe that very early a group of sayings circulated around that that he said, but all of them were not included in the gospels. Now, after he had uh, finished his speech, he fell on his knees with them. That's where I think his consecration service uh, took place. Let me go down to chapter 21 now. Uh, When we had torn ourselves away, the etymology means to separate by force. That's the the force here of uh, William's translation. We struck a beeline. There's one of those nautical terms. See chapter 16, 11. Luke uses a lot of nautical terms, and they're very accurate. And then we'll see verse 3 for another one. Uh, They struck a beeline for cost. Now, cost was a sight of uh, the famous, uh, you've heard of Hippocratic Oath for doctors. It was uh, the site of a great medical school. Uh, Hippocrates was from this. Apelles is from this area. The next day to Rhodes. Now, Rhodes was a very famous island, famous for its roses, where it gets its name because of the climate. It had a large university there. It was a large commercial center. The university majored in rhetoric and oratory, and this is where uh, Paul came to. They didn't stop there long. And from there to, now mine has P-A-T-A-R-A, now, this was a very famous site of one of the Apo- uh, oracles of Apollo. It even rivaled Delphi at one time. At this point, it's not. There's a Western addition to the text here that I think is not accurate, but mentions another port city in the area. Verse 2, there we found a ship for Phoenicia. Now, Paul had been using coastal ships that kind of hugged the coast and stopped at every port. Now he's going to take a seagoing commercial vessel and cross uh, the, the uh, Mediterranean there and save a lot of time. Uh, and so we went aboard and sailed away. After sighting Cyprus and leaving it on our left, there's a nautical term. Man, I, don't you know that Paul and Silas thought about Barnabas and John Mark, who, who were on Cyprus and a missionary team there? I bet they did. And put in for Tyre, for the ship was to unload there. So they stayed a few days in Tyre. But in Tyre, uh, we looked up the disciples. Now, how did the church in Tyre start? We don't know, but probably the dispersion of Stephen, Acts 11:19. Uh, and we stayed a week with them because of the impressions made by the Spirit. They kept on warning Paul not to set foot in Jerusalem. Now, these impressions made by the Spirit, now we'll see back in chapter 20, verse 23, and later on, chapter 10, I mean, chapter uh, 21, verses 10 through 12. Paul knew what was facing him, but he still believed it was God's will. God kind of showed him what's going to happen, but it didn't mean God still didn't want him to go. Now, um, okay. But when our ship, when our time was up, we left there and went on, and all of them and their wives and children, first mention of children I know of here in Acts, went down to the beach, they knelt down to pray, another commitment service of this church. Notice how quickly the Christian fellowship sealed the bond between Paul and these believers. Now, they hadn't met him before, but boy, very quickly, there was compassion and love there. That's the way it ought to be between us folks. We're family members. We're thicker than blood. There ought to be a love, not a a nervousness. (laughs) Verse 7, on finishing the sail from Tyre, we landed at Ptolemais. 
this is the Old Testament Acho. This is the, the, we know it by the crusader name, Acre today. You might want to see Judges 1, 31. Left there for Caesarea. Now, whether it went by land or by sea, we're not sure. This is the Roman headquarters on the Palestinian coast. There he met Philip, an evangelist. We're not sure what an evangelist means. The title's not used that very often, but we find him there back in Acts 8:40. Apparently, he lived there. Tradition says him and his daughters moved to Asia, and his daughters had a long prophetic ministry in Asia after Philip died. We get that from Eusebius's quote of Polycrates and, and Papias. Now, notice he had four unmarried daughters who are called uh, prophetesses. I think we've done too much in saying women can't be church leaders. They are church leaders many times. There's got to be a balance, I realize. But God always uses gifted women. He uses these. Now, Agabus, that's a prophet that we heard earlier, back in chapter 11, verse 27, came down in symbolic action, showed Paul he was going to be in prison. This symbolic action is much like some of the prophets in the Old Testament, like Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, they begged him to stay. He said, quit, you're breaking my heart. It's God's will that I go. I must go. So they, he went on, and they, he, he said, the Lord's will be done. You, it's a present middle imperative. You might want to see 1 John 5, 14 for a parallel to verse 14. They got ready, got their bags together, and started up to Jerusalem. Everything is up to Jerusalem. They stayed with a man there named M-N-A-S-O-N. This guy was a Hellenistic Jew from Cyprus. Some of the Jewish people there, even their believers, would have been nervous about keeping these Gentiles, and so they found a Hellenist to stay with, and next time we'll cover Paul's stay in Jerusalem. Well, I've really enjoyed being with you. I hope to see you same time, same place next week. God bless you.